All right, everybody. If you would. Okay, friends. Uh, welcome back to our second week in the uh, in the Scriptural Foundations of Justice program. Uh, last week we had a, a, a wonderful conversation with our very own Dr. Bob Gibbs. Um, and, and we'll move out into the community of faith here in town for the next few weeks and hear from folks from other worshiping communities here uh, in and around Tallahassee. And I am so excited tonight to have my friend, Stephanie Posner, who is the Director of Education and Music at Temple Israel. Uh, and who was able to pull herself away a few minutes early from welcoming kids to Hebrew school for this evening to be with us uh, to share a bit. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, Stephanie, I'm going to, I'm going to hand it to you uh, okay. to, to, to share. And, um, and we're here. There's uh, four of us in the room and then another, I don't know, 15 or so online. So please. Thank you, Nick. So, hey, everybody. I'm, I'm so glad to be here, and I was so thrilled um, at being asked to, to join you. Um, and I believe we discussed that this, this uh, session would be on uh, texts that sort of have inspired me to justice personally. Um, and so I thought I'd also take a little opportunity to maybe give you a little Hebrew lesson and sort of delve a little deeper into our text um, because there is something very loud playing in the background. I don't know what that is. Um, I apologize. Um, so I know that when you guys do Bible study, it's very similar to the way that we do Bible study. We sit down, we read passages together, and we discuss. Um, and we also look at the sages. And there's been lots of commentary over the years. So what I wanted to do is not just give you a piece of text, but show you a little bit of um, different perspective on it. Um, and we'll delve into that. Now, do I have the ability to share, my friend? If you don't, you will hear in. Oh, it looks like I do. Great. Do you? Um, uh, yes. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, it should. You you should be able to go. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? We are. Fantastic. So, if you want a little Jewish music lesson too give you a little one just in a minute here. Can you see <clears throat> this first text here from Leviticus 24-22? There's all these little symbols on here. Like there's like one that looks like a, a greater than sign and then a dash above then like a little corner and then two dots over a letter. Do you guys see that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the Torah itself, the first five books of Moses, in the scroll, um, you may or may not know this, has absolutely no vowels in it. So, and sometimes the words sort of run together. Um, and so this um, musical language called trope was developed. And if you see some of the copies of the, of the um, five books of Moses called the Chumash in a book, you'll see these little markings on there. And the reason they were developed was so that the correct emphasis could be put on the right syllable and that it was said with the right intention. Um, and also probably to make sure people were paying attention at some point. Um, <laughs> but these are sequences and they're musical sequences. So there's a way to chant them. They each have their own kind of sound. Um, for example, these two right here, this is called a mercha, and this is called a tipcha, and the, the notation sounds like mercha tipcha. So you just apply those notes. <clears throat> so you could read the English, you will have one form of justice for the convert as for the native, for I am the eternal, the almighty of both. It sounds very profound. Yes, it is profound. But if you listen to it, 
Mishpat echad Adonai lachem, kager ka'ezra Adonai, ki ani Adonai lachem. Sounds a little bit different, right? But that ani Adonai lachem, I am the mighty of both. Still pretty kind of <laughs> profound, right? Anyway, so that's your that's the music part of the lesson for today. <laughs> um. But this particular piece of text for me, one form of justice for the convert as for the native. Mm. And there's further, sorry? Sorry, I thought I heard somebody. There's, there's further um, study and, and text on this that one form of justice it is one god for all people right so whether this is a person who has converted to be with the the, the tribes of the children of israel or is living on the outskirts it's the same form of justice because it is, it is one god for all to me that is it speaks volumes about the world that we live in and even when I was coming up and studying text as you do, <clears throat> for me, this gives me a sense of we are all equal in the eyes of God. In, in Hebrew, we say we are bitzelem Elohim. We are all created in the divine image. And we look for that divine spark in everyone because there is one guide and we are all created in God's image. So why should there be a different sense of justice for everyone? Any of you know this particular piece of text? Is this something that you guys have come across? I'm sure you've come across it before, right? Yeah. And does it speak to any of you? It really does. Is that Amy? Yes. Yes, that's Amy. I was reading today, um, my Sojourner magazine came and this resonates with about half of the articles that I read today, just so strongly. Oh wow. Well, I'm glad I'm glad we picked this to look at tonight. Um, the other piece of this, you know, whether someone is of great wealth, uh, whether someone is poor, living on the outskirts of the land and um, you know, glean like picking up from the from the, the the farmland what was left over, or whether they're the farmer putting the the crops out there. They each are the same. Justice is justice, um, and we're going to get to a little Hebrew lesson in just a minute. But this next piece, I, I picked a few. I hope that's okay. It's hard to just pick one piece of text that's inspiring, I think. Um, so this is from Mishnah Avot. Um, the Mishnah is, uh, and forgive me if you already know any of this stuff, I'm just making sure everybody understands where we are. The Mishnah is a collection of um, sort of, all of a lot of sages, um, and it's, it's where we get a lot of the modern Jewish tradition from, because we practice rabbinic Judaism now. Um, and it's, it's what the rabbi's perspective on the Torah portions are, right? So this particular section, Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, ethics. I love the fact that that's a huge part of our tradition in Judaism. Um, so Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, who is one of the most famous sages, um, and he's often sometimes called the Abba Shimon. Um, he used to say, on three things does the world stand, on justice, on truth, and on peace. As it is said, execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates, Zechariah 8.16. So this one particular stands out for me because we have a song that we sing, which is also from Pirkei Avot, because a lot of this stuff is sort of conversation um, between different rabbis. It's also said that the world stands on three things alone, on prayer, on Torah, right? Um, I have to do it in Hebrew first. Um, 
and truth. So this is slightly different, but I love that justice is a piece of this because justice and truth to me go hand in hand. And how can you have peace without justice, right? It's like a tripod, yeah? They do stand together. Um, so for me, this one is a little bit different than the, the standard that we sing when we carry the Torah around the sanctuary. Al Shloshah Devarim is the song we sing. Um, and the one that we sing in Shul uses the word avodah for prayer. And avodah traditionally in biblical Hebrew means work. Um, and so in modern Judaism, since we no longer um, have the temple and we don't um, abstain from certain things, we, we do abstain from certain work on the Sabbath now, um, which is designed to remind us of those days. But back then, we didn't have prayer in the same way. We have another word for prayer, which is tefillah, but now that avodah, that work is prayer. And so if you think about it, prayer is not easy. It can be very heart-wrenching, right? So maybe we should make this not a tripod, but a, a table, right? Because the hard work that goes into the prayers can also go into the actions of what we do to help acquire peace. And the only way that we're gonna acquire all of that is we have justice for everyone. Now, you guys feel free to shout out anything. And if I'm talking too much, Amen. say something. <laughs> I love that. Good. I like it too. It, you know, I think oftentimes we get caught up in this, you know, I pray for, for peace. Okay. I pray for peace too. Um, and I'm also going out and doing something so that we can get it. <laughs> right. Amen. Because Amen to that. the prayer is only a piece, a piece of that. Um, you know, and in Jewish tradition, the way our prayers are developed, you, you cannot pray for personal things. You always have to pray. There always has to be an element of your prayer that requests betterment for the world. Um, so remember prayer is work sometimes it's internal work i see mary margaret has the hand raised uh but mary margaret's husband sam <laughs> is to talk to stephanie I, Lan, Lan, this may or may not be appropriate for what you're talking about but i hope you won't mind my raising the issue anyhow last week uh, bob gibbs cited uh, several sections of the bible and i came back after that meeting and i looked them up and made notes about them myself and one one particular section of the of Leviticus that really got my attention was Leviticus 19 chapter 19 um, 33 which deals with immigrants <laughs> yeah when immigrants live in your land with you you must not cheat them any immigrant who lives with you must be treated as if they were your citizens. You must love them as yourself because you were immigrants from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, etc. And that that's that strikes me as particularly important with this issue of justice, particularly as it relates to people who are trying to get in our country for a better life today. And I'd like to, if, it, if, if you have, if you're, if you're familiar with this subject, I'd like to have your comments on that, if you, if you don't mind. I'm I not, look, I'm not looking for an them. argument, I'm looking for information. Oh, no, no, no. Um, I, I'm happy to give them to you. Um, as I said, and I don't know if you were on when, when I said this, but there are so many pieces of text to do with justice. Um, and that was one I almost picked because it is a very important part um, for me personally. Um, there was, uh, and we say it every year at Pesach, we also say it in our weekly prayers um, during the week and in the evening, it's part of um, the Micha Mocha prayer that we do. Um, you must always remember that you too 
were wanderers in the land of Egypt. Um, and you treat the immigrant as you wish to be treated, as if they were your own people. Um, and further down, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that too in some of the, the text that I've chosen, not from Leviticus, but um, for me personally, I will tell you, um, immigration is a huge deal for me. Um, not just because I am the great grandchild of um, a family of Jews that were kicked out of the Russian pale um, during the pogroms, um, but because I feel that everyone is entitled to justice and peace and a fair life. Um, and a few years ago, I started an organization called SAFE, um, which is Safe Asylum for Everyone. Um, and I, it happened when there were people um, being separated from their children at the border and children were being put in cages for lack of a better term. Um, and it's something that I personally stand strongly by. I'm very involved with HIAS, which is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which was founded to help immigrants, initially Jewish immigrants coming over um, or getting them out of Nazi Europe. Um, but now I would say that HIAS is more involved with helping immigrants um, and refugees of the Islamic tradition than the Jewish tradition get out of unsafe countries um, and not just place them in the United States, but place them wherever they can be placed and safe. Um, and we even have every year, this, this, it's the first weekend in March this coming year, um, but we have um, the annual Refugee Shabbat where we stand up and say, we believe that the immigrant should be treated fairly and justly. And we're standing together in, in Sabbath peace and together sharing that with our community. So um, I'm in 100% agreement with that one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. One thing I just, one last parting comment is, how can we stay in, in this country as citizens and look people in the, in the, straight in the face and say that we don't want you here because you're immigrants when we're immigrants ourselves? I don't know how people can do that. Um, I don't come from a community like that. Um, and I know many of, of you feel the same. Um, I don't understand that mentality. Um, for me, that is the most ungodlike way that you could be. Um, when I said we are all but Selim Elohim, we're all created with that divine spark in the image of God. And we just have to look to find it. And sometimes we do have to really look really hard to find that divine spark. Um, but I don't know how to change the minds of those people, apart from trying to get them to even have a conversation, to listen, to, to not be antagonistic. Um, there's so much arguing, um, I feel, when this subject and, and others are brought up um, in the justice arena. Um, but not everybody, and there are some people that claim to be people of faith who, who just don't understand that either. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to, to why people can stand there and say, I live as an American citizen and I don't want immigrants in this country. And I will tell you that I think there is an issue internationally on that front as well. Um, now listen, I love Israel dearly. Um, I was raised to love and appreciate the land of Israel. Um, there are immigration issues in Israel as well. They, there are some folks that feel like we don't want to bring any more Ethiopian Jews into the country. We're at our capacity. We can't take any more people. And you may not know this, but Israel has a policy that if you are Jewish and you want to make what we call Aliyah, if you want to go and move to Israel and live there and become an Israeli citizen, if you are Jewish, that door is always open to you. 
So how can they be in a position to say, no, 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 we're full, sorry. I don't get it, especially not, not Israel. Tiffany, I have to add, I think a lot of people are thinking economics. And sure. that's basically what it all boils down to. It's not like welcoming a stranger, <clears throat> but how can we afford to pay for all the people coming across the borders? I, th I think you're that, right. That basically is what I think it boils down to. I think it is too, except if you continue to read text, both yeah. in Jewish tradition, Islamic tradition, Christian tradition, you will see time after time after time that mm -hmm. there should be no, no situation where you do not take care of the poor, right? right. There is enough for everyone. And our, our faith traditions, I feel, should, should lead us down that path to make room and to make sure that we can take care of each other. I think we've all gotten to a, a place where, you know, that, that saying of who dies with the most toys wins, you know? And I often, I, I take a step back and I look at my surroundings and I go, I'm grateful and I have many, many things. Do I need this many things? Do, 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 should I stop now, right? Um, and, and it is it is a painful thing to see people, not just immigrants, but people that are um, without shelter, children without Mar food. People you know? who are marginalized. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it goes completely against our faith traditions to allow that to happen. And it doesn't, and I don't think it's a political thing. I know plenty of Democrats and Republicans who feel the same way as I do. People should not be living in the street. Children should not go without food and should not be educated. You know, in the Jewish community, education is like the first thing you know has to happen for your children, right? we study, we study, we study, and not just <laughs> Torah and, and everything else, but academically too. We want our children to go into the world with knowledge and not just with knowledge, but to always be questioning and to always be asking and learning, right? <clears throat> That's why if you look at Jewish tradition, um, are you familiar with the Talmud? Is anybody not, let me move this around because I may not be getting everybody's hands. Oh. <clears throat> okay. um, so if you are not familiar with the Talmud, let me just see if anybody's. Okay. Well, if you look at the Talmud, which is a collection of arguments is the best way I can describe it, <laughs> of rabbis, over hundreds upon hundreds of years, and you can actually see it in the text. They, they will argue with each other. They'll argue with a rabbi from 300 years ago. No, he's wrong. <laughs> you know, that is what's so beautiful about it. There's a different perspective. Just because the text is the text doesn't mean that you take it verbatim. You should talk about it. You should study together. You should never study Torah on your own. You always study with a partner at very least, right? Because there's more than one opinion and part of that opinion and that decision-making and understanding is compromise. We'll get to that one in a minute. Any more questions before I move on to the next one? <laughs> Good. Okay. So we looked at Pirkei votes. So now we're at Mishnah Torah, um, gifts of the poor. So this is um, sort of commentary of, you know, the medieval rabbis. Um, and so here we have, we must observe the precept of tzedakah. 
more carefully than any other affirmative command because Sraka is characteristic of an upright person, the offspring of our father Abraham. As it is written, I have singled him out that he may charge his children to do what is right, Genesis 18. Only by means of tzedakah will the glory of Israel be reestablished and the religion of truth perpetuated, as it is written, in righteousness you shall be established, Isaiah 54. Israel will be liberated only through tzedakah, as it is written, Zion shall be redeemed by justice, tzedakah shall be the saving of those who return, Isaiah 1.27. So here's your Hebrew lesson, folks. <laughs> okay. So you see this word right here. This word is tzedakah. Tzadik, dalid, kuf, hey. Hebrew is a language of roots. And in this case, the root of the word tzedakah is tzadik, dalid, kuf. You may also know in Hebrew that sometimes you'll see a word and you'll think, it means this, but it doesn't because it really depends on the context of the sentence and the whole paragraph in many ways. So you often hear tzedakah as um, charity. And sometimes it is. When we collect um, tzedakah from the children at religious school on Sunday, we ask them if they brought their tzedakah in and they'll put a coin in the tzedakah box. Um, and it is a charity box, but it's called that because charity is a form of righteousness. And tzedakah is also sometimes translated as justice, right? The word tzedek. So a tzedek or a tzaddik is a righteous person, right? Who is known to pursue justice. But you can't be just without righteousness. So they do go hand in hand. Um, so that's why I wanted to show you this particular one because it depends on the context of the sentence. And we won't get into masculine and feminine text <laughs> versus, um, you know, whether we're talking about just the whole people or um, in this case, Israel, Tzedakah, we've got justice and righteousness in the same paragraph. And I like this Mishnah. Um, and this is when I say we get deeper into the study. So we could just look at that simple line in Genesis, but it's much more fun to take what the rabbis have, are writing about it because they often use other pieces of text to validate their arguments. So you'll see them in contact with each other. Um, and this, this is where the the real juicy fun stuff comes in. <laughs> okay, so on with the Hebrew lesson. This is something you've probably heard. I'm guessing you have. Tzedek, tzedek tirdof, justice, justice you shall pursue. And Jews are big on saying that, but they also leave the rest of the sentence off. This is from Deuteronomy 1620. Justice, justice shall you pursue that you may thrive and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I want you to think about that for a minute. Read it over a couple of times. I'll even, I'll even chant it for you. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, the yershot et ha'aretz, so, anybody want to give a little wandering into what that means to you? Not just that said, justice, justice shall you pursue, but the rest of it, that you may thrive and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What does that say to you? Just unmute and speak. We're all friends. Hmm. It, for me, it says that you really can't be prosperous and live a good, abundant life until everybody can. And it sounds like a command, which justice is a command. <laughs> so it's like, yet again, you better do justice. 
then you'll thrive and occupy the land. <laughs> um, yep. So it, it, it sounds like a conditional, maybe a con, like contractual, kind of, you know, you know, um, from God that you, that justice is, is the utmost and everybody should thrive. So you yes. got to do that first. I agree. It's almost like God is saying, well, you're an alien in my land, so you better do it right and take care of the people that come along in your path because I'm giving this to you. Yeah, this is a privilege, right? (laughs) Anyone else? Time to turn at some point, you know? I'm sorry, say that again said you know the tide could turn on you at some point where you know now maybe that land isn't yours anymore and now you're on the on the end of of needing justice (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) because remember everyone has to thrive right because everyone must be treated equally right so if everyone isn't being given justice isn't being treated equally you know I, this land is being given to you. I mean, what do we say to our children, right? I know you want that that new game that's come out. Mm-hmm. I, I know I asked my child, I think that's wonderful that you want that game. It sounds very exciting. What is it about that game that's that's so important to you? And what do you feel that you have done to earn that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're going to have some more fun now. We're going to go super medieval to one of the most famous sages, the Ibn Ezra, who came from 11th century Spain. And he says, oh, there goes my camera. (laughs) Justice, justice. Moses speaks to the disputants. Moses repeats the word justice to indicate that one should pursue justice, whether one gains or loses. Or the word is repeated to indicate that one should pursue justice as long as one exists. Or the word is repeated for emphasis. So we got a couple options here, yep. And this is what I mean, like the sages, even Ezra starts this, and then somebody else, we're gonna look at what Rashi says, maybe about a hundred years later in France, but they're, they're, they're getting into the depths of it. It's not that simple right? There's more to this. Look deeper, look past what you're seeing on the page. And you guys are doing that right now. And that, that gets me very excited as, as an educator here. (laughs) So let's look at the Sanhedrin. Um, This Sanhedrin is a tractate, a section of Talmud. Well, let me grab one so you can actually see what that looks like. Yeah. Well, that's the crux of it right there. I'm back. <laughs> so this is actually one tractate of Talmud, volume one and volume two. That's why if you ever see like a, a rabbi's library, they'll have hundreds of these things on the wall. But the cool thing about this, I mean, I've got lots of <laughs> papers in mind and sections of study so this one we've got the center here I don't know if you can see this this down here is what we call the Rashi script and Rashi is the most the foremost scholar really um, from the middle ages Um, and then all of these oh there go all my papers all of these texts around them our commentary by his grandchildren, right? So it's, when I say you want your children to study, he wanted his children to study and his grandchildren and his grandchildren's children. And then on the left side, you have a more modern, you've got a bit of English translation in there with some bits of Hebrew in there. And this is where it gets fun because this is where the rabbis argue with each other, big time. So I always like to show a little Talmud so you can 
see where it's coming from, right? So this is from Sanhedrin. Anybody familiar with the word Sanhedrin? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the court system, right? Mm -hmm. um, so two volumes on, and I will tell you, often things happen, conversations happen in an attic amongst the rabbis, amongst the rabbis. <laughs> You'll actually see that. In, in the attic of Reb Shimon ben Elazar, they had a conversation about yada, yada, yada. Um, but they can, it's really hard to come to a decision about how many people will be in a court, right? And it's not, it's not easy. Even the conversations about death penalty, I can't tell you chapter after chapter after chapter, there is always a section of no, 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 no. But what if there's a witness that lives three villages over and the person is at the base of the pit waiting for the stone about to fall? They can still raise their hand and say, I have a witness because the rabbis didn't actually want to give the death penalty to anyone. That's a whole nother conversation. Maybe we can have that one night. But we'll read in Sanhedrin, tractate, Sanhedrin 32b, 6, as it is taught in a baraita. So a baraita is a, a commentary from a rabbi in what we call the Gemara, but it didn't make the final cut. So it was important enough to mention, but it wasn't set in stone. It wasn't made law, but it's worth it to talk about it because it gives some, some um, context for conversation and debate. So as it is taught in a baraita, when the verse states, justice, justice shall you follow, one mention of justice is stated with regard to judgment and one is stated with regard to compromise. Let's take that for just a moment. One for justice and one for compromise. We can't always just make a definitive answer. Look at the jury system. People have to talk through. And I you know I was on a jury recently and there was a long conversation where we have to really look at things carefully and go, you know what, maybe, maybe I need to take a step back and say, am I looking at this correctly? you know so here we go how so where there are two boats traveling on the river and they encounter each other if both of them attempt to pass both of them sink as the river is not wide enough for both to pass if they pass one after the other both of them pass and similarly when there are two camels who were ascending the ascent of Beit Koron where there is a narrow steep path and they encounter each other if both of them attempt to ascend both of them fall if they ascend one after the other, both of them ascend. So for me, this, I wanna know what you think first. I could talk mm -hmm. about this all day, but it's more fun to hear what you think. Looks like Pat's trying to talk, I think, but he's muted. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I just said I'm not sure what to say. You're not sure what to say. Well, think about it for a minute. Think about it. If you feel very strongly about immigration, like we just talked about, right? And you feel that people should be welcome in our country because they are children of God and everyone has a right to a safe home. And you have someone else who says, well, that may be so, but we can't afford to take those people in. Do we then both just go, I guess we're at an impasse. Or do we then pursue the conversation and say, I understand your point about economics, but we're told time and time again that we have to provide for the widow, for the orphan. Don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind. I mean, t 
time and time again, we are to glean. Right now, we are, for example, in a Shemitah year, which is where you have to let the land every seven years, you don't touch the land, right? So people have gathered and saved and, and in Israel, they actually follow the Shemitah process. So there's areas that you can't, um, can't farm, you can't plow. Um, but even if people don't have, they make arrangements for other people to, to have food. So do we then just say, okay, we can't afford it? Or do we say, hmm, perhaps we could reallocate funds? Would that make it possible for us to allow more immigrants to come into our country? And maybe the other person says, huh, you know, I didn't think about that. Let's have a look and see where our money's going. And maybe we don't get to bring in as many immigrants as we want to, but we get to bring in some. And then maybe next year that conversation goes further and further, right? But we know we are doing justice, right? Because we're compromising. Well, it takes thought, right? Instead of emotion. <laughs> Because I think it's human nature for us to want to go first, you know, for my boat to go first or for my camel to go. Well, like I got to, I got somewhere to be, right? I got to go. Right. But if you sit there and you think it through, well, like if I try to ram my way through, then we're both going to fall. But if we sit down and we think it through, no, why don't you go first? It's only going to take you five minutes and then I'll go. It just takes some thought and probably conversation between those two people in the boats, which is basically what you're saying. Like, <clears throat> let's sit down and talk about it. Let's think about it. And what sounds like compromise is probably not compromise. It's just your boat going before mine so yeah. that we both can go. Yeah. And I think if you do that, Leah, both can gain something, even though both lose something. Whereas in the alternative case, neither gains anything. Yes. Yes. Uh, Good point. Stephanie, this is Sam again. Uh, Mary Margaret always says that I approach every subject with an open mouth. And, uh, <laughs> I like it. And, I, and I, that's okay by me too. But <laughs> going back to your question about uh, what do we do about an immigrant when we can't afford it? Well, another answer to that might be, maybe we can set aside some money in the U.S. kitty to set about to create better living conditions in the country they're coming from that they're running from, which would encourage them to stay there. That might be a, a, a compromise. Yeah, yeah. But, but that only comes up in conversation, right, Sam? So, yeah. so somebody who is maybe perhaps thinking, we need to bring every immigrant here, you bringing that subject up is like, oh, I never even thought about that meeting. No. Well, Mary Margaret's going to chip in and say this, this uh, passage that you're reading just emphasizes that we don't live by my way or the highway. Yes. True. You got, you got to find a way to get together. Agreed. Agreed. And this is not making a comment uh, because we are ourselves so different with different backgrounds and different experiences. And we look at the same situation and we see different things. And it's one of the reasons that many times it is, like with the jury, so important to have more than one person assessing a situation so that you get all those variety of views. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, there's, a, there's more conversation because there was a lot to put in here and I wasn't gonna, <laughs> we could just fill this whole page up um, but there's more conversation about this, this justice, justice section um, from Rashi, um, the, the, um, the, the French rabbi that I mentioned earlier, where 
there's there's perspective that justice also means we're talking about land that there should be um like a court system there should be a judge an honest true judge provided to people whether they are in Eretz Yisrael in that land um, of the children of Israel or if they are on the outskirts because a, a righteous and true judge should be available to all and like you say how do we have we have a jury it takes so many different people we're, we we come from different backgrounds and so forth how do you find that one true judge and there's if you read in sanhedrin there's there's even more conversation about how long do you wait to find a judge if there's no there's no judge in the area and there isn't like a, a nominated person for their absence, then you have to gather a certain amount of people and travel to the next town over with the person who was being accused and the accuser and go until you find a judge in the next place over. And how long do you wait for that justice? You don't, you don't just say, well, maybe we'll wait six months till somebody comes back. And we'll see how it goes then, because, you know, Harvey's out of town with the family. No, you you want to pursue justice swiftly, not just because you want to provide justice for whoever is wronged, but you want to provide justice for the person who is accused of committing the crime as well. Right. Everyone deserves justice. Anyone else? Did we did we talk about that phrasing in one of the earlier passages, the, the religion of truth? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything else to say other than I'm that sounds wonderful. And I don't, I don't. I think I know what it means, but it, it just sounds great. That just really struck me when you read this idea of the religion of truth, which we, I feel like we're living in the opposite. And we have, I think in, in America, we've been living in the opposite or always, but now people are doubling down on untruths um, and legislating untruths, right? And hiring, very true. based on us <laughs> you know so anyway that that really struck me um and i'd like to know more about that idea well i mean you know again part of it is in the interpretation um for me and the way it's interpreted in this section of mishnah torah is that only through righteousness and justice together, right? Because remember, we're talking about that word tzedek and staka. They go hand in hand. And it is only through the means of justice that you can have truth perpetuated over and over. You, you can have honesty and integrity, right? Um, and sometimes the truth is ugly. And sometimes the truth is hurtful to us. But, and there's more passages, oh gosh, you know, maybe we could just spend a couple of days together studying. <laughs> there's, I would there's, love that. Oh, there's, truths. <laughs> there's more, more text relating to, um, you know, if you, you can't, even if your intention is to help the person who is struggling by um, deceit, right, by by making the, the, the scales lean in their direction for justice, you are not helping them because you are lying and you are committing falsehood. So while that person may be getting off, they're not actually receiving the justice that they deserve. And sometimes punishment is important because we learn from it. So then you get into the whole sequence of the Sanhedrin and, and you know, what kind of punishment can be given for certain kinds of things. 
And I think there's, do you guys know what, what being stoned to death actually is? What do you, let me ask you what you think it means. Being hit with a lot of rocks, right? No. The oh. actual meaning. Is it, hmm? is it a, a, a huge like uh, um, platform of stone that, that is laid on top of a person and crushes them down? Yeah. So a person would stand at the bottom of a cliff of sorts and mm -hmm. there would be a giant yeah. rock formation that gets pushed off and crushes them. It is actually the most painless version of death penalty there is because it's an almost instantaneous death. It, there's also other forms um, where there's something with to do with a, a lit wax in your mouth. There's some pretty gruesome, disgusting <laughs> things um, in, in the Torah, um, in the Talmud about, about um, how people should be put to death. But, but what's interesting is they do everything possible to make it impossible to fulfill any of them, right? They want to make sure that they have every witness possible. And you know, theoretically, in Judaism, we believe that the only person who has a right to take a life is God. And there's only been one instance since Israel became a state where the death penalty has actually been used. Um, and hmm. that was for a very famous Nazi. Eichmann, Eichmann, wasn't Eichmann. it? Yes. Yeah, they, uh, I remember that. I remember and that I'll trial. Like, yeah. And that was, that was, that there were other Nazis that had been prosecuted in Israel. Um, and I think after Eichmann's death, I think the general consensus was that goes against everything we really believe in. And who are we to make that decision, even after all of it, right? Yes. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a tough one. It really is. And there, there are plenty of Jews who believe in the death penalty. And, you know, it's, it's a hot topic for debate. Um, I grew up initially in the Orthodox community. So I lean a little more in the Orthodox way when it comes to things like that. Um, especially in the, the realm of justice. And I, I have a hard time with it because to take a life, you take your own in many ways at the same time. Uh -huh. And I can't imagine for me that that would feel like justice is served. You know, I, I just, and, and I can't speak to it because I've not been in a situation. I mean, thank God I've never been in a situation where, you know, there is somebody that has admitted to murdering someone that I know and that I may feel like, you know, I, I want that justice. So I don't want to speak for other people. And I can understand how somebody might want that, but I still feel like, you know, Let's move from, from the death penalty for a second and go to <clears throat> gun use. I remember after Pittsburgh happened, Tree of Life Synagogue, and 11 people were, were taken away from the world. Um, and the security guard had a gun. There, there was an armed guard at the door and didn't do him any good. But we were talking security-wise after and what we were going to do to help protect our congregants. Um, because there was a lot of anti-Semitism that was rife at that moment. Um, and it was being pushed by certain political figures. Um, but we had a couple of congregants who said, I have a concealed carry license. I'll wear my gun to services. And I said, it, are we going to vote on that? I said, I know I'm not a board member, 
But let me tell you how strongly I feel about not having somebody sitting in our congregation wearing a gun. I have worked at this temple at the time for 10 years almost. And I love this community. I love this congregation. And this is my job. It's also my livelihood. I will quit today if that is what is going to happen. Because I can't in good conscience ask someone else to potentially take someone else's life. Because what if it happens in a split second? You don't know who's walking through the door. You could misconstrue somebody's intention. And I, I said, I'll walk. And I was not the only one. There were other people who said, no, this, we can't have this. And we can't, we can't live our lives being afraid, but we certainly cannot ask our community to take the life of another person. It's just not okay. Yeah. Anthony. Mm -hmm. So back to the illustration about the boats passing in the river and the camels on the pass. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it struck me when I look at this is that is that you have two two folks trying to occupy the same space at the same time, mm -hmm. and and that and that in order for them to get past the impasse is a reordering it's a quite literal reordering of how of how of how they're situated in the world right it's, yes. a, it's, a, it's a you know and to me that's a, a kind of a you know a foundational aspect of restructuring society is beginning to reorder how we're how we're lined up uh in the world that we live uh and it and so when i hear justice justice i begin to think you know that it's it's like a lot of times we think about compromise as is uh is everybody is everybody gains a little and everybody loses a little but the, the previous commentary that you provided about you pursue justice even with whether you okay i'm sorry you're breaking up or, Nick. or whether, whether whether you gain or not yes whether you gain or you or, or you lose right you pursue justice Correct. And to me, and to me, that goes hand in hand here, right? It's, it's. I may need, I may need to, to, to move myself, right, behind, or, or to, to put myself in a different sort of situation, uh, in order, in order to make space for somebody else to get by. Right? Like I may need to do that. Yep, that's true. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> yes, Dot. Can. You talk a minute about working with children to begin the process of their understanding what justice is. Uh, you can hear a two-year-old say, that's not fair. <laughs> and, uh, but that's the beginning of where Every one of us begins to learn and understand about justice. Yeah. So do you have any comments about work with children to give this process a firm foundation? Absolutely, I do. <laughs> um, we have we have a preschool at the synagogue um, that is is its own sort of entity. But in the religious school, um, our students come to us starting like three or four years old. Um, and one of the things that we do is focus our activities based on Jewish values. So our Gan Yeladim, our, our, our kindergarten, it's not really just kindergarten, there's, it's like four and five-year-olds, they begin their day. We teach them what it means to um, do acts of kindness, give me lut chasadim. And we, we sit down and we say, you know, what have you done that's kind this week? And we share and they get kindness stars that they put on the board. Um, and 
as the year progresses and they learn more and more about mm -hmm. the, sim the most simple of things that are kind and how much joy it brings other people, not just the people that they're doing them for, but everyone around them who is excited for them, their friends in class, their teachers, mm -hmm. they really mm -hmm. learn that it's a much happier place to be when you are simply kind to people. And that's, that's our foundation. And then we start working in things, um, Jewish values for anywhere from um, kindness to animals, welcoming the stranger. You know, we have a holiday called Sukkot where it is tradition that we welcome guests, we welcome them to our sukkah, um, which is like a, a hut. Um, and we eat our meals there and everybody comes and brings something. And whether you bring something big or you bring something small, we all share it. Um, and we do acts of kindness all the time. You'll often hear them called like a mitzvah, um, but the true definition of the word mitzvah is commandment. So it is a commandment to be kind. It is a commandment to do acts of loving kindness for people. Um, so we begin in the in the very basic there and then as they get older we bring in other aspects of jewish life of text of stories um but the biggest thing is we don't just have them sit down and make a paper menorah and go home and say oh we learned about hanukkah today um that's a whole nother story and we'll have a conversation why I don't like Hanukkah one day. Um, but we teach our children by asking them questions and asking them to ask us questions and to be inquisitive so that they can understand what their teachers think, what their friends think, what their parents think. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we work with our families to instill some of these things at home as well. And I think the more they they are with each other and they love each other, they bring it out into the community. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we have like mitzvah makers. We have children who are three and four years old. We start them going and putting food into bags to give to Second Harvest of the Big Ben. We start them with early mercy work <laughs> and through that mercy work say, gosh, can you imagine what it would be like to not be able to come home and have a snack after school because there's nothing in your cupboard, right? And then later on that conversation develops, wow, that would be terrible. Why do you think that is that maybe you wouldn't have food in your right. cupboard, right? So they start to understand, sure. yeah. sadly how the world can be, but also they get excited about how they can change it and what they can do to do their part. I like to think of Jews and Judaism as a religion of doers, right? We are actively pursuing justice, actively making change. Um, it's very easy to write a check and say, here you go, thanks so much. Um, I've, that'll buy some food for, for, for you and that's great. But no, we wanna get in there and, and feed people. And we also wanna get in there and change the reason why people are hungry, right? <laughs> so what can we do to fix that? And for us, you know, yes, you have the 10 commandments, but the truth is, is that there are 613 of them, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not just the 10. <laughs> and when you start digging into those, right? Um, well, Stephanie, that's a uh... It's it's seven thirty five. Oh, sorry. If, if we're going to all of those take... commandments, sorry, uh, we're going to need some. Extra time. If we're going to go through all of those commandments, we're going to need some extra time. I think. <laughs> uh, look, Stephanie, thank you so much for being with us. And clearly, nice. clearly, there's a hunger for some more dialogue here that we need. You and I need to figure out how to make that happen. Yeah, I'd be very happy to do that. Sorry, sorry, I got a little morbid there at one point. But. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Thank you so much for taking time, for being with us, for sharing from your My condition. pleasure. Your, and in your you. heart, right? And this justice work, we greatly appreciate it. Oh, it is my pleasure. And I'm so grateful that you guys brought me 
to your to your community and I look forward to learning with you again and, and learning from you as well, even more. Thank, Thank you so Thank much. you. Thank, Thank you. So Shalom. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That was well done.